When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you will never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Now that is actually the anthem of the Liverpool Football Club in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and various ones of you may be supporters of other clubs, but let's just reflect on this particular anthem for a period of time. They've actually had it as their anthem for, over, for almost 50 years. Originally, it was a song written by a gentleman called Oscar Hammerstein in 1945 for a musical called Carousel. And then since that time, many different artists, including Elvis Presley, had done various covers of that song. And in 1963, a Liverpool band, remember we're talking about the Liverpool Football Club, a Liverpool band called Jerry and the Pacemakers. I don't think they must have had heart pacemakers at that point in time. But anyway, we had Jerry and the Pacemakers. They did a single cover of it and they released it and it went to number one on the UK charts very, very quickly. Just prior to releasing the single, they went to the manager of the Liverpool Football Club and they played him a copy of the single that was about to be released. And he was so impacted by it, he thought, what an outstanding song. And they had this tradition at the beginning of the game in, in Liverpool there at the Anfield Stadium, which seats 54,000 people, before the games would begin, the home games, they would actually sing some of the, the songs on the charts. This is 54,000 people singing at the top of their voice on the charts. And so they began to sing this song around about that time. And they've continued to do that year after year for 50 years. In fact, I've never been there. Maybe some of you have, but I have looked at the video on YouTube. And you can see as they're singing there, there are people coming to this part. You'll never walk alone with tears in their eyes, so passionate and involved in singing out this song. Why do they have such passion about the song? What is it about this that has so captured their hearts for 50 years? In fact, the song, the words, you'll never walk alone, are now part of their crest. It's actually on their crest. And as you walk into the stadium in Anfield there in Liverpool, you'll find that there is actually a gate which has those words, you'll never walk along on the gate. Part of the reason it's so deeply embedded in their culture and they have such a passion about it comes out of tragedy. Because in 1989, in a place called Hillsborough, there was a game between Liverpool and the Nottingham Forest team. And in the part of the stadium where the Liverpool fans gathered, there was a crowd crushed and 97 people died, 766 people were injured. That whole event created enormous controversy over that time, enormous tragedy. It is the worst football worst sporting tragedy in the UK of all time. And despite the controversy, despite the tragedy, nevertheless, the football team of Liverpool came together and the fans came together. And in a church service, someone read out the words of this song. And then a cathedral choir sang this song, You'll Never Walk Alone. Can you can begin to see the poignancy and the power of the song speaking to people as they're going through a time of grief and of tragedy? Tragedy. And those of you, many of you, if not all of you, have experienced times in your life of grief and of tragedy when you've just wanted someone to be there for you and know that you're not walking alone. Just in uh, April 5th was my, the anniversary, my, sorry, my father's birthday. And he died in August of 2010. And coming to his birthday just a few days ago, I'm looking back and remembering my dad. And I'm also remembering my mum who died in, uh, just a couple of years ago and thinking about that. And there's a loneliness when you go through that grief and you go for that sorrow of losing people who are very, very dear to you. I remember though when I first heard the news because I wasn't in New Zealand at the time, I was here in Melbourne and I hadn't, I'd visited my dad. I'd, I know it might have been the last goodbye. I'd come back to Melbourne and sure enough, in a few days time, I had the call that he'd passed away and my daughter put her arm around me as I'm 
tears in my eyes there to comfort me. I wasn't walking alone. My wife, you know, she was there, there for me. My family was there for me. I wasn't walking alone. And nevertheless, there is still a loneliness in her heart when we go through those times of grief and sorrow. But I want to say to you today, if we're walking with Jesus, if we're following after a risen Saviour, then we can know with absolute confidence, whatever we might sense in terms of loneliness or grief, we will never walk alone. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Is it true? Absolutely it is. Does it matter? Yes, it does. And one of the reasons why it so matters is if we have that faith in Christ, if we know that Christ is with us, where we feel that or sense that or not, we can have a total faith and confidence because he's risen that for all of eternity and through all of time, beginning from this moment on, we will never walk alone. Today, we're going to reflect on one of the Easter stories. It's a powerful Easter story. They call it the road to Emmaus. It comes from the book of Luke, which we've been reading through and following through over the last seven weeks or so. And I want us to enter into this story. I want to imagine ourselves being in this story as one of the disciples walking with Jesus, but not recognising him as we're walking along a, road from, along a road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. There were two disciples on this day, three days after Jesus had died on the cross. And here they are, they're walking along and a stranger joins them. We know it's Jesus, they did not recognise him. And as they're walking along, they change their whole understanding of life, the world, destiny, the future, creation, God himself changes and is transformed from hope, from lost hope to a risen hope. So let's now look at Luke chapter 24. And here in verses 13 to 14, we find the beginning of the story. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now help us, to help us imagine this story, as we've done over the last few weekends, I want us to look at some paintings so we're not just listening to the story, but we're help using the painting to help us imagine ourselves in the place of the story. The first painting we're going to look at is actually called The Road to Emmaus. And it was painted in about 1877 by a gentleman called Robert Zund. Robert Zund was a landscape painter. He lived in Lucerne, Switzerland. And he would often use the landscapes around his native town there to actually illustrate and paint his paintings in a lot of detail in the landscapes that he painted. Here he's painted one of these landscapes, but it's the picture of Jesus walking with the two disciples. Jesus is the figure in the middle, dressed there in white. We know that, but the two disciples walking with Jesus do not know that. And there's some interesting things as we just pause for a moment and reflect on this picture. There are two disciples there, one whose face we can see and one whose face we can only partially see. And as we read on through the story over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll discover that we only ever know the name of one of the disciples. And Luke, who authored this story, wrote this true story, reflecting back on the experiences of people and these two disciples as they told the story to him or to others. Luke here is, in a sense, inviting us in to be the other disciple who he does not name. I'm relatively confident that we, he would have known who the name of that disciple was, but he doesn't name him as like a, a way of saying to us, well, why don't you put your name in there? Why don't you yourself enter into the story? If you look at this person, it's clear that he's a male at this point in time, although we don't know whether he is or isn't, but Robert Zund has painted him as a male and possibly a young male. And his hair is turned away, his head is turned away. How do we know he's a male? Because his hair has been cut to a shoulder length and men in Israel, we can go back through the ancient scriptures of Israel and we discover that they do and are meant to cut their hair from time to time. And so this is a young male walking with Jesus whose name we do not know. Maybe you're a young person, male or female. Maybe this is you who can imagine yourself into the story, walking with Jesus, but not actually knowing that it's him. You can notice some other things about this painting as you look at it. They're standing in a shadow, in a place of darkness, a place of grief, and yet they're walking into the light. And as you look at this painting, one of the things I want to capture is these disciples are not at this moment in a place of joy and excitement, even though it's three days after the crucifixion. They're grieving. They're lost. They're in a place of darkness. And even the own grief that you may have experienced may be helpful for you in understanding what these two disciples are experiencing at this point of time. So as we come to this scripture... 
I want us to imagine us in the story, and we're going to go through it verse by verse with some reflections that can help us picture how this story can actually speak into our own lives. Let's now read on. Luke 24, verses 15 to 17. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing them. him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Interesting insight if we just pause on this part of the scripture for a little bit of time, that not only were they talking, they were discussing. And if we understand the meaning of the ancient languages here, which have accurately translated to English, this was not simply a conversation, a comforting conversation where they're comforting each other for the grief and loss that they've experienced, losing a loved one who they'd walked with for three years and now died a shameful death on a cross. No, yes, they were grieving and they were conversing, but it was not a reflective dialogue reflecting about the theology of what might have happened. No, because we're told they're talking and discussing, and the word discussing there is kind of like percussion. It's like two opinions coming together. It could have been translated as striving or even arguing. And then Jesus, as an outside observer who they don't recognize, sees this. He comes in and he says, what are you discussing? What are you talking about? And the word he used there is literally two opinions clashing together. It's anti-ballo, from which we get the word anti-ballistic. It's kind of like they may have been going even ballistic with each other. They're actually, the, they, were, they were having an argument. One of the tragic things when people go through moments of grief and of loss is as much as it can be a time of comfort when we don't walk alone where others can comfort us, it can also be a time when deep wounds and deep hurts emerge within families and within friends and with those who are grieving. And there'll be a time when there are even arguments and disputes over what do we do here and what do we do there. There can be a time of fracturing when you come to this time of grief within families and within friends. So we need to understand that this is what's happening here. These disciples are having a bit of a dispute as they're walking along and they're grieving. And at those times, we often need someone else to step in there Someone else so that we're not walking alone. I want to tell you, so, tell you today, whatever grief you may be walking through, whatever tragedy you may be walking through, whatever frustrations you might be having, whatever arguments you might be having, if you're a follower of Jesus, if we're walking with Jesus, we do not walk alone. We have a risen Saviour who's there with us walking through all of the storms and all of the waves of life. Yet sometimes, many times, we just don't recognise Him. If we continue on through the story, we find that Jesus then begins to talk to them, but they're, they're in this place of grief and they don't recognise him. They stood still, their faces downcast, grieving, if you like, alone, feeling, feeling as though we've lost someone. And one of them, clear past, asked Jesus, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? Oh, you can almost sense there a little bit of sarcasm coming into Cleopas's voice there. He's thinking, How, you haven't, don't you even know what's going on here? We also recognise here the name of one of the disciples, Cleopas, which gives us a little bit of a hint about some of the possibilities about who the other disciple could be. Here's another painting. It's painted by a lady called Carol Foray. She's a contemporary US painter, and she's painted this. It's the way to Emmaus or the road to Emmaus, which that affects. So it's about the Emmaus journey. And you'll notice a difference if you look at this painting. The disciples that we can see whose face is turned towards us is a male, Cleopas. The other disciple, if we pause and reflect on it, is actually a lady, a woman. How do we know that? Because she has long hair. And within the Jewish culture, for many hundreds and hundreds of years, long hair was a sign of beauty. And it would only be in very, very rare circumstances that a woman would actually cut her hair. And here we have a lady standing there, but her back is turned to us. So once again, it invites us into the story, but not now as a young man. It invites us into the story as a lady and as a woman. And so none are excluded from this story. We are all invited in, whether we're male, whether we're female, whether we're young or we're old. We can all imagine ourselves in this story. The Bible doesn't actually tell us the age or the gender of this unknown, unnamed disciple. But we do know that Cleopas was married to a lady called Mary and that Mary was at the foot of the cross as Jesus was being crucified. She was there. She saw it all. She experienced the grief and the loss. 
So there's a high likelihood, because as we go through the story, they invite Jesus into their home. There's a high likelihood that either this is Cleopas and maybe one of his sons, or even maybe even more likely it is actually Cleopas and Mary walking along in their grief and in their star and having a bit of a heated debate and a heated discussion. Those of you who are married will know that sometimes those things happen and you just persevere through those things. And sometimes you need to know that someone is walking along with you. And I want to say to you again, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Is it true? Yes, it is. Does it matter? Yes, it does. Because if Christ is risen, we know with confidence from now right through to eternity, we will never walk alone. Jesus, at this point, begins to talk with them and takes them on a journey from loss of hope to restored hope. He asks them a question, what things? Why? Because he, did he need to know? No, he was there. He, he knew all about it. But he's, if you like, he's being quite a good counsellor here. He's getting them to talk about and share about their experience. And then they reply together about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. I wonder if you sense, as I feel I do, the, the shame in that for them, the, the, the grief there is in that event. They didn't know about the resurrection. They saw this whole thing happening and they were grieving. And that's where we come to the next verse, which is actually the turning point in the whole story. And as a powerful verse, if we just pause to reflect on it, they then say to Jesus, but we had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Can you see in those words there, if you just pause for a moment, that these were two people who over three days, they had lost their hope. In the original languages, it says, we're hoping. But within the context of the actual story here, the English translators in a number of translations have brought out the fact that this was, a, yes, a hope that had continued on for a number of years as they'd walked with Jesus, but it was also a hope that had come to a complete stop and a complete standfall, not only standstill, not only were they hoping, but now standing still, talking to Jesus, they're lost their hope had been lost. The very English language with the consonants at the end of the word kind of captures that full stop. We had hoped. It was a full stop. It was a period. Hope was gone. That's where they are at the point in time, at the lowest point of their grief. They've lost the hope that they had that Jesus would come and he'd restore them and he'd, he'd He'd take them out and lead them into a place of victory over the injustices and over the tragedies that happened to them personally and to their nation. Here they were and that hope was gone. That's where they're standing right now. And they don't recognise that Jesus is there with them. But in asking that question, Jesus is also inviting them to consider the story and go a little bit further. And we even find in their own words, they now begin to discover a glimmer of hope. Verse 24, they continue on. Verse 22, they continue on saying to Jesus, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find the body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the woman had said, but they didn't see Jesus. And then Jesus helps them. He takes them that step further. He begins to actually give them some of their other insight. He says to them, how foolish you are. And I, I think he's kind of saying this with a, with a smile on his face, knowing that he's actually the hope of Israel who's come to restore hope. He says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what is said in the scriptures concerning himself. Luke here doesn't tell us which 
scriptures he used. But those of you who have read some of the Old Testament scriptures will know that time and time again in the ancient scriptures of Israel, there are prophecies and there are pictures and there are stories which point forward to a redeemer who would come. One of those is the story about the lamb, the lamb who was slain in their Passover feasts that they had regularly year after year. And Jesus came and when he was walking on earth, he was, he, people declared over him, here is the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Maybe Jesus was talking about that and sharing about that when he was walking along the road with him. Maybe Jesus is talking with them and sharing with these two disciples about the prophet Isaiah who hundreds of years before had declared that here there would be a suffering servant who would give his life, who would be whipped and wounded and he'd be wounded for our sins, he'd be wounded for our transgressions. Maybe that's what Jesus is reflecting with them as they're walking along the road. Maybe Jesus is even going back further and talking about the King David, the ancient king of Israel, this, this king who ruled all over Israel. And God had appeared to him and said to David, you will have a son and your son's kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. His throne will be everlasting. And Jesus had come as the son of David, descended from King David. And now maybe he's explaining to them that now risen again, he's going to ascend up to heaven as king of kings and Lord of lords, our risen king, our risen saviour. Or maybe, maybe Jesus is going right back to the ancient patriarch Job, who wrote and said, that though my flesh lies in the grave, yet will I see God. With my own eyes, I will see God. I know that my redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth. These are ancient scriptures way before the time of Jesus, but they all of them point forward to this moment where Christ is risen. Luke doesn't tell us which, which things that Jesus shared with them, and maybe that's because, so that we don't get just locked into one particular of the ancient scriptures, but we as Christians or followers of Jesus will look back and read the scriptures and we read through the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament, then hope will begin to burn in our hearts and we begin to realise that Christ is risen, that He is the Saviour of the world, and because He is risen and because He is the Saviour of the world, our sins are forgiven and we can find life and we can find renewed hope in Him and we will never Walk alone if we're walking with Jesus. They continue on walking with Jesus. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Here's a powerful principle. You know, if our hearts have been stirred as we're hearing the story, the good news of Jesus, if our hearts are stirred in the Good Friday services that we had, or as we're in a life group and we hear people talking about Jesus, or if we're a follower of Jesus and we begin to, and we remind ourselves around the communion table or at various other times about the truth of this news, one of the things that we absolutely need to do, if not the fundamental thing that we need to do, is invite Jesus in. Invite Jesus into our homes. Invite Jesus into our lives. Invite Jesus into our meal tables. Invite Jesus into our hearts. And maybe there's some of you today who you've never taken that step of actually inviting Jesus into your heart. And as everyone here closes your eyes, and we just bow our heads, I just want to have a small opportunity now for those of you who have made, never had that step, taken that step of inviting Jesus into your life. I ask you just to lift your hand and some of our ushers will come and they'll give you some, a, a book and a Bible and some resources which will help you know how you can be a follower of Jesus and invite him into your life. So if that's you, you'd love to invite Jesus into your heart today. I invite you to lift your hand up. Our ushers will give you some resources there and I'll also pray for you. If you like, there's also QR codes on the backs of the seats there and you could put your camera on that and that will actually link you to more information about how you can walk with Jesus and invite him into your life. Certainly you can meet with some of our our team afterwards in the visitors' lounge. We can describe more about that to you. And if you're watching online, just type in the chat box there, yes, and someone will come to you and will give you more understanding of what it means to invite Jesus into your life. So for those of you who have lifted your hands now, just lift them up high if there's others of you who haven't done that yet. And our usher will get some of those resources to you. And I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I pray for those who responded. I pray for those who may have responded online or here in the room. And I pray, Father God, that as they invite you into their heart, as they give their lives to you, Father God, that you would come 
You'd eat with them. You'd join with them, Lord. You'd be their savior and deliver. You'd deliver from their, them from their sins. You'd deliver from their past. You'd deliver them from that. And they'd come into a relationship with you, a walk with you, where they'll never walk alone for the rest of eternity. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may open your eyes now. And we're now going to continue on through the story. And we find that when Jesus comes into their home, he was at table with them and he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talk, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now we can look back and maybe with a little bit of envy or jealousy think, oh, I wish I'd been there. I wish I'd actually seen Jesus. I wish, I wish he'd actually come into my house physically and had a meal with me. And then, then, I would, then I'd have total confidence that he's alive. I want to say to you now, 2,000 years later, we can still invite Jesus in. We can still eat with him. We can have communion with him. We can come together and have a, a communion meal together. Or even in our own homes, we can have a devotional time with him where we spend time in the scriptures. And as we tend to spend time in the word of God, as we enter into the story, as we live in the, in the story of Christ dying and rising again, then something begins to burn in our hearts and our eyes of our understanding, our eyes of our mind and our heart can be opened to see Jesus, not necessarily physically, but very real and very present with us right now today in 2023. And maybe you've walked through some grief and some tragedy and some times when you're thinking to yourself, boy, I just feel alone. Where are you, God? Well, we can always come then into that place, alone and aloud with God, just lingering with Him, but not alone at all because we have Jesus with us by faith. There have been many times in my journey when I felt a little bit alone, let's be honest about it, even when there are a lot of people around you, even when my parents died, or maybe there's situations in your life. A divorce can be a very tragic time. Chronic illness can be a very, very tragic time, and there can be a sense of aloneness. My encouragement to you today is that if you're a follower of Jesus, you will never walk alone. Christ is with you. And practically speaking, what do you do in those times? We can come to the Scriptures. We can enter into the Scriptures. We can live in this story, become a part of it, and it becomes our story as well like that disciple who's not named, walking with Jesus. Over the last three years, from about 2020 through to 2022, I've journaled in my devotional diary three times when I actually spent a lot of time in this particular Emmaus Road story. And as I did and just read it aloud, spoke it out aloud, spent time meditating on the verse, spent time thinking about it, spent time imagining myself walking with Jesus, I came from a place of feeling a little bit hopeless <laughs> to a place of restored hope in a risen saviour. Because if we're walking with Jesus, we never walk alone. I remember back in 2022, January 2022, my wife and I were in, uh, in the quarantine for 10 days in New Zealand in a hotel there, just in one room, apart from an hour a day where we got some exercise. And as part of our devotions, we slowly read through this verse and we prayed through it, this story, and we imagined ourselves as Mary and Cleopas in the story. And as we did that, it became very deeply, deeply meaningful to us. And we began to realize, hey, look, in certain situations, we all have situations we face where promises don't seem to be fulfilled or things don't seem to be happened. And then God began to restore hope, as he'd done before two other times for me, meditating on this particular verse. So I want to say to you today, maybe in the week to come, if you're in that place of feeling a little bit alone, why not come to this verse and imagine yourself walking with Jesus because if you're walking with Jesus, you will never walk alone. There's person after person over thousands of years of history who have done exercises like that or spent time with Jesus or imagined themselves in the gospel stories and they have come to a place of feeling as though, sensing as though, knowing with confidence that God is with them. Nevertheless, there are also times when we don't have that sense. But these stories of other people can be very encouraging to us. And I want to share one of those stories with you now. We've read about the Emmaus Road story. Here's a more modern day story, which kind of captures a similar sense of us never walking alone. Ernest Shackleton was a polar Antarctic explorer. And Roald Amundsen was the Norwegian polar explorer, Antarctic explorer, who eventually got to the South Pole in Antarctica 
and won the race there to get there. Shackleton decided just three years later, in around about 1914, that he was going to go one step further and he was going to take a party of people from one side of the continent of Antarctica through the South Pole right across to the other side of Antarctica. Set out in 1914 on a ship called the Endurance and they came to a part of Antarctica in the ice there and they're ready to offload and start the expedition. But then the ice started to crowd in on the wooden ship, the Endurance, and it started to crack and break. They had to abandon ship. They had to come out with, put their lifeboats out on the ice packs there and watch the ship being totally cracked and falling into below the ocean, below the ice there. They're looking at that and thinking, what do we do now? Well, they wait a number of months until the ice actually melts. They get into the lifeboats and they sail those lifeboats up to the top tip of the Antarctic Peninsula to an island called Elephant Island, which is deep in the South Atlantic Ocean below South America. By the time they get there, many of them are exhausted. Some of them are really sick. One of them possibly even had a heart attack. And so they leave many of the people there and six of them, they work on a lifeboat to make it even more seaworthy. And six of them sail in that lifeboat across 720 nautical miles, which I believe is something over a thousand kilometers. They sail that distance right across the deepest parts of the Southern Ocean where some of the stormiest, the most powerful wind gusts are and huge waves. They sail right across that to land on a small island of South Georgia. There in South Georgia, they land on the Southern beach where there's nobody. And three of them stay behind on that beach, unable to go any further. Three of them, including, including Ernest Shackleton, climb the glaciers and the mountain passes over to the other side of the island in the north to find a whaling station. Took them two years, 36 hours to get over that particular part of South Georgia, Georgia but from the beginning of that expedition to then two years. But when they come to that whaling station, they're able to send people to pick up all the rest and all 28 men survived. It's a powerful, powerful story of courage and perseverance and leadership in the midst of the storms and the waves of the Antarctic. Ernest Shackleton wrote a book reflecting on his journals about that time. And this is one of the things that he wrote. When I look back at those days, I do not doubt that Providence guided us not only across those snowfields, but also across the stormy sea which separated Elephant Island from our landing place in South Georgia. I know that during that long march of 36 hours of the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it often seemed to me that we were four, not three. It often seemed to me that we were four and not three. Sometimes in the storms and the waves of life, we can feel alone. There's only one of us. But if you're following Jesus, there's one more. We can feel as a couple in a marriage or a relationship, hey, we're alone, there's just two of us. But no, there's one more, there's three. We can feel in a life group or a ministry setting or a family setting, anyone, say there's five, six, seven or eight of us. But if we're following Jesus, there is always one more. Because if we're walking with Jesus through the storms and waves of life, we're never walking alone. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Is it true? Yes, it is. Does it matter? Yes, it does. It matters because if Christ is risen, then we are never walking alone. We're walking with Him to all eternity. And yes, we may not recognise Him at times. Yes, we may not see Him at times. Yes, there may be times when our heart doesn't fully engage, but yes, Jesus is walking with us and we can have know that with absolute faith and confidence. Yes, there is an always an empty chair in your life group. There's an empty chair in your household. There's a person in your home who's walking with you if you're walking with Jesus. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord, our risen Saviour. Why don't you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray whatever storm or waves you're going through, that there will come, your eyes of your understanding will be open, your heart will begin to burn and you'll begin to realise with a faith and a confidence, you're not alone, Christ is with you. And then as I, after I prayed that, we're going to sing and make a direct declaration. 
that He is our living hope and we're walking out of lost hope into restored hope. Lord, I pray for everyone here who's been going through times of storms and waves and maybe grief and of loss, whatever that might be, illness, Father God, breakup of relationship, Lord, even death may be God. Whatever those storms are, whatever those waves are, I pray, Father God, as we've shared today, your gospel story, the story of your resurrection, your death and your resurrection. I pray, Father God, they would find life they would find hope and they would find restoration in You, Lord God, and that they would know, every one of us, deep in our hearts, Lord, that if we're walking with You, we never walk alone. Thank You, Jesus. Christ is risen. It's hallelujah. Praise the One who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roving lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on, we sing this out one time this morning. Come on. Yeah, then came the 